Before creating a system that handles user input, let's have a look at a few input devices. There are of course thousands of different types of input devices, but the majority of them can be categorized in such a way that covers most cases. For example, have a look at this exotic device, which is a board with keys on it, and although I haven't yet entirely figured out how to use it, I know that all these keys have just two discrete states, which is either pressed or unpressed. Therefore, we can already define an input category for discrete input with a value that's either 1 for pressed or 0 for not pressed. Here is another device that looks like a flagellum, but is called a mouse for some reason. It's got a few buttons that can have a pressed or released state similar to a keyboard. In addition, the position of the mouse is a free range input that can have any value, and therefore it's another category of input. Turning the mouse wheel can also result in any value, but in general we are only interested in direction in which the user turned the wheel and how fast they did it. Next we have a PlayStation controller, which has both discrete and free range inputs. However, it also has continuous input buttons. These are buttons that can have a continuous range between 0 and 1, where 1 means fully pressed and 0 means fully released. Any value in between means that the button is not fully pressed, but also not fully released. The thumbsticks and trigger buttons belong to this category. Paying more attention to the difference between a thumbstick and a trigger button, we can see that trigger buttons don't have a direction and therefore only have a single scalar value between 0 and 1. However, the thumbsticks have two directions towards which they can be pushed. So they actually have two values in x and y direction that can be between 0 and 1. We can even think of input devices that have three axes for their input. For example, the V and switch controller's position are in three dimensions. To account for this variety of input axes, we'll return input values using a 3D floating point vector. Ok, back to spherical coordinates. In case that you are not already familiar with this, it's a way of describing a point on the surface of a sphere using only two numbers. The first number is theta, which is the angle that a vector from the origin to that point makes with the pole of the sphere and has a range between 0 and pi. The second parameter is phi, which is the angle with respect to the positive x-axis. Phi has a range between 0 and 2 pi. We can convert any Cartesian coordinate that is on the surface of the sphere to spherical coordinates using these equations. And we can convert spherical coordinates to Cartesian coordinates using these equations. When we implemented directional lights, we added a free list which we called light owners with its elements pointing to the light data. We separated the light data that we sent to the GPU from other data, such as lights entity IDs, to make it easier and faster to update GPU buffers. There is also another reason that's got to do with how we manage callable light data. Because the number of point lights and spotlights can become rather large, it's extremely beneficial to put only the data which is used by the GPU to do lighting calculations in an array, and to keep that array as compact as we can. In addition, because light culling stage uses a different set of light data than the shading stage, we have split the data for each one into a separate array. We also have an array of IDs which point back to light owners. Later we'll have a few more arrays, but I'll use these three for simplicity. The explanation remains the same when we add more arrays. When handling the data, we can view each element in these arrays as being part of one item that is split between the arrays. For example, when we remove a light, we need to remove it from the same entry in all arrays. As I mentioned, light owners point to their data using an index, and the data point back to an entry in light owners array. I duplicated this free list in order to avoid having arrows all over the place, but it's the same free list displayed twice. 
Now the idea is that we keep all light data for lights that are enabled in a contiguous array. We have a counter that keeps track of how many lights are enabled. For example, if we want to disable the second light in this list, we swap its data with the last enabled light. We also update the indices in light owners array to point to the new locations. And finally, we decrement the enabled lights counter. Now we are left with a tight array again. We can do the same trick when we want to remove a light. However, this time we remove the light owner and also mark the owner ID with an invalid ID. Again, we decrement the enabled lights counter. As a last example, when we enable a light, we can swap it with the first disabled light and increment the counter. We keep the data for each light in a few arrays that belong to the light set class. This data is then copied three times to GPU accessible memory. This is because we have three frame buffers. This basically forms a small ring buffer with three elements, with each element being an instance of D3D12 light buffer. Whenever we modify a light's property, we save that change in the light set class first, but we need to also communicate it to the GPU. That means that whichever frame buffer we are at, when there was a change, we need to copy that change to the light buffer that's going to be used for the current frame. So to keep track of which buffers have been updated and which ones still need to be updated, we set as many bits in dirty bits flags as we have frame buffers, which in our case is 3. Then every time a buffer is updated, we clear the corresponding bit. After all bits have been cleared, we are done updating the buffers until something changes in the light set class again.